completely expand our category of known functions which we can differentiate. Wow. Right now, we know how to dif differentiate like 2% of functions. Um, and then in a half an hour, we're going to be able to know how to differentiate like 90% of functions. Um, okay, so first, a warm-up example. Uh, so let's take the function, um, let's, take, let's take the function uh, sine x. Okay, we know, we know what the derivative is. So make sure you like zoom in and get all the text and all that kind of stuff. Okay. That's important. Um, so we know how to, um, we know how to, web rows, that's not talking about. We know how to take the derivative of this, what is it? Cosine x. It's cosine x. And um, recall how we, uh, how we prove, well, there was the proof, but before the proof, there was the conjecture. And the conjecture we got by um, kind of experimenting. So we drew a graph of sign. And um, also, I, I made uh, sure to remind you that you should try to make the graph, when you're looking for, when you care about things like slopes, you should try to make the graph square. In other words, uh, you know, you should try to make your pi's be about three times your ones. Uh, and so we graphed sign, and um, we like you know we looked at it, and then we conjectured that the graph was cosine. Among other things, um, we looked at this line right here, and we conjectured that the slope of that line is one, so that the derivative of sine at zero should be one, right? No problems. And then in fact it was one, so that was like pretty good. Okay, so now comes a function. Uh, a new function, uh, a very similar function, uh, sine 2x. So, um, without thinking about it more than three seconds, just shout out a wild guess. What do you think the derivative of sine 2x is? Okay, good. Um, so, conjecture by 70% of the class who, who bothered saying anything at all, um, conjecture that the derivative of sine 2x is cosine 2x. Um, now, actually, that you have 20 seconds, uh, examine this conjecture and tell me if you think this is true. So I'll just write a question mark. No. Wait, why not? I should I should participate. Never mind. Sine x plus x. Uh, by the way, I can graph this. What is the graph of cosine of sine two x look like? Um, yeah, it's just sine x, but now like squeezed together by a factor of two. So, thoughts? T. You think that's right? Yeah. Okay. T is sticking by the original conjecture because it's just squeezed by two, right? So that doesn't change anything, does it? You know. You know. Well, if you squeeze sine together, then like the slope gets increased. So, so this is what you were saying, also, right? Yeah. Let's let's just think about think about the graph of sine two x versus sine x, or maybe we just do the graph, right? So here's um, here's pi, here's one. So it's um, now the period of sine is pi, so it's going to be like a little bit of this and like this. So now it's going to be like this, right? So. What is the slope of this line now, do you think? Twice as much? I think it's going to be twice as much, right? Because the y coordinates have all stayed the same, but the x coordinates have all been cut in half. T, yeah. now, are you abandoning your conjecture? Yes. T abandons. T, do you have a new conjecture to replace this? Um, sine 2x. Uh, the derivative yeah. of 2x is 2 Yeah, all right, so he thinks now probably there's a 2 in there, and I, I bet that's right, right? So if we just kind of, if we just kind of wing it, and we say, all right, the slope here is like 2, so I put a little dot here, and then the slope at, I guess that's going to be pi over 4, the slope will be 0, and then at, um, by symmetry, the slope at uh, pi over 2 will be um, negative 2, uh, and then the slope here will be 0, and then the slope here will be 2 again. So yeah, this does look a lot like cosine 2x. Um, okay, now just confirm that this is in fact true, by using a um, indubitable technique. I mean, what, what can we do? Double angle formula followed by product rule. Yes. Um, Eli Hartman says, yo, just do it. Uh, I happen to have uh, a formula for sine 2x, the double angle formula. It's just 2 sine x cosine x. Please um, take the derivative of that function 
uh, by using the product rule and see what you get. We know how to take the derivative of sine, but I did not ever give you any problems like sine 2x. And that's because the, the technique for differentiating things like sine 2x is, is just a bit more complicated. Um, and so in fact, what, what's really at issue here? What kinds of functions? No. Functions on functions. Functions on functions. Yeah, I like that answer. Um, yeah, composite functions, right? It is, it is, it is the um, you, sine 2x is kind of like a composite of the sine function and the 2x function. And now that, we, now that we've kind of mentioned this, suddenly you should be realizing, damn, there are a lot of functions that I have absolutely no idea how to differentiate. Um, such, as, uh, such as, I don't know, sine of x squared, for example. No idea what to do there. Um, or how about the derivative of you know e to the cosine x, or something like that, right? This is the composite of the sine function and the squared function. This is the composite of the e to the x function and the cosine function. I have absolutely no idea how to do any of these, but of course there are many, many functions which are in fact composites. Um, all right, so this is what we're going to learn today, a technique for differentiating the composite of two functions. All right, before we do this, I would like to take kind of a step back and look um, at what composition of functions is really all about. So, um, so this is, okay, this is kind of like a, like a, almost like an algebra one kind of lesson, but with calculus mixed in. Um, so, and I don't know whether you did this with Giles last year in pre calc eight. He drew these kinds of pictures, but anyway, we do it now. Uh, so, uh, let's take let's take our function uh, f of g of x. Uh, the computation of f of g of x is kind of like a story. So, let's what happens? What's the first thing that happens uh, in that story? Yeah, g of x. Can you be more specific? Yeah, you plug x into the g function, all right? So the story involves beginning with the g function. You begin in the domain of g. Okay, so we can draw a picture like here is a circle, and let's just call this circle uh, the domain of g. Uh, so let's suppose that x is some, uh, is some number in the domain of g. And when you plug x into g, then you get something back again, right? You get g of x. So here we go. Uh, this let this be uh, the range of g. Uh, and so what we have is some point here, which is g of x. And what does the g function do? The g function, well, the g function simply takes points in its domain and matches it to points in its range. You guys have seen these kind of pictures before, like in algebra one or precog or something? No. All right. Are they yes? Maybe. Um. Cool. Okay. What happens then? Of course, what happens next? What do you do with g of x? You just plug it into that. Okay. So it better be that this point is in the domain of f. So suppose that is the domain of f. It's not necessary that the domain of f and the range of g be the same, but the output of the g function. Some of the outputs of the g function might be in the domain of f, and some of the outputs of the g function might not be in the domain of f. But if, if, if they land out here, then they can't be in the domain of this function, right? Because then you get stuck. Okay, so hopefully it looks kind of like this. And then, of course, what's the last thing that happens? You plug it into f, and so you get over here this kind of picture. This is now uh, the range of f, and this is this point, f of g of x. So, jean. Okay, um, so that's what happens when you plug it in. You plug it in, it goes to g of x, and then it goes to f of g of x. And this, so this is what the f function does. All right, um, but now, uh, that's just pre-calc, or even like algebra one or whatever. But now I want to do calculus. 
So I want to, I would like to conjecture, or I would like to get some deep understanding of what the derivative of f of g of x is. All right, so now we need to, um, we need to somehow, we need to add calculus to the picture. So everything becomes, instead of this sort of static pre-calculus picture, we sprinkle some like kind of magic, uh, like pixie dust of sort of infinitesimal sort of thinking. Everything becomes a little bit liquid and sort of moving around and, 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 and kind of fluid. And now what we need to figure out is, all right, what happens? What happens to this function when I change it a little bit? All right, and what is the derivative of a function after all? The derivative of a function tells you how the function responds to change. The derivative says, all right, if I change x by a little bit, what happens to f of g of x? That's the question we need to answer. I'm going to say it one more time. When I ask for the derivative of f of g of x, what I'm really saying is, if I change x a little bit, what happens to f of g of x? Right? If the derivative is big, then the function will change a lot. If the derivative is small, it will change a little bit. Okay, so what we're now going to do is we're going to kind of go through what happens if you change x a little bit and sort of track these changes. Okay, so supposing I now change x a little bit. So instead of plugging in x, I plug in uh, x plus h. How does that affect things? Well, if I plug in x plus h instead of x, of course, g itself is going to, g of x is going to change. It's going to become a slightly different number it's going to become g of x plus h. Now, what, uh, what determines how much g changes? That's a kind of a vague question a little bit. Alan Edge. The derivative of g? The derivative of g. Alan Edge says it is precisely the derivative of g which tells me when I change x a little bit by how much the derivative of g changes. Um, if the derivative of g is big at this particular point x, then this number will be quite far from, from, from this point will be quite far from this point. If the derivative is quite small, then it will be not so far. And if the derivative is negative, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I'm just going to write down over here, um, like, I don't know, I'm just going to write like relevance. A and No. E and T. A and T. I think it's E. It's A. It's A. Okay, relevance is. Uh, a relevant fact is g prime of x. Um, Helmet says g prime of x is relevant because it is precisely g which tells me by how much this shifts. Okay, and then of course this, whatever this little change is, is going to sort of percolate through the, the problem, right? Okay, now here comes the sort of tricky part. What, um, so, so this is going to change by a little bit, but then also the final result is going to change by a little bit. Right, the fact that this number changes means that this kind of moves a little bit too. So this ends up as f of g of x plus h. In other words, a little bit over. But what determines by how much this moves over? Yanni, what determines by how much this change? What determines how much this changes? The derivative of f, she says. Okay, but that's a little bit vague. Because it's not, it is the derivative of f. The derivative of f is relevant, but it's not the derivative of f at x. It's the derivative of f at g of x. Right? Because it is, it is um, the only number which I'm plugging into f is g of x. So what matters is f's behavior near this number, g of x. Okay, perhaps we should come up with a little bit of, exa a little bit of an example so we can see this. So suppose that my function is, um, is sine of x squared, okay? So I'm trying to figure out the derivative of sine of x squared. Uh, and suppose I'm trying to figure out the derivative at uh, x equals 3, okay? So I, um, all right, so let's call, uh, let's call the function f, uh, let's let f be the sine function, and let g be the function x squared. Okay, um, so um, now mentally replace all these x's with 3's. Okay, so I'm plugging 3 into the squared function, and what, what I get back, of course, is, is 9. All right? Now, if I add in, if I, instead of plugging in 3, I plug in 3 plus h, what do I get back? Well, I get back, like, a number which is a little bit more than 9. Okay? How much more than 9? 
Well, it is precisely the derivative of g which tells me that, right? Um, and what is the derivative of g? Uh, the derivative of, uh, of g is uh, 2x, um, which means that the derivative at 3 is, um, is 6, okay? Which tells me that this function, x squared, is changing at the rate of 6 um, when x is 3, okay? And that tells me by how much it's going to be off by. Um, but now, what number do I plug into the sine function? Do I plug 3 into the sine function? No, I don't plug in 6 either. What, when, I'm do, when I'm doing this, I plug in 3, 3 turns into 9, and then 9 gets plugged into sine, right? So what matters is, and of course I can compute the derivative of f, f prime would be cosine, but cosine tells me the instantaneous rate of change, this, this function tells me how fast sine is changing. But I don't care how fast sine is changing at 3, I care how fast sine is changing at 9. Aaron, do you see this? It's at 9 that it matters. And okay, it's not a nice number because this is, didn't pick a, like, a beautiful example or anything, but f prime of 9 is cosine 9, whatever that is. So that number, cosine 9, that tells me how fast this function is increasing. So the other thing, well, the other thing which is relevant is the derivative of f at g of x. All right. Um, so here, here is kind of our conjecture. So, all right, this, so the, here, here's what this thing is called. It's called the chain rule. And here is what the chain rule says. The chain rule says, if you are taking the derivative of something of the form f of g of x, then this is what you get. Uh, well, it is the uh, it is the derivative of g, which we already talked about as being relevant, times the derivative of f at g of x. In other words, that it is just the product of these two things. Um, okay, why does this make sense? Okay, so this is a super loose proof, like super loose. This is the kind of thing that Newton would have done. Newton said, all right, um, when I'm asking for the derivative of f of g, what I'm really asking for is how much does the f of g of x function change um, when x changes by a little bit, right? So relative to a small change in x, how much does f of g of x change? Okay, watch this. This is like magic. The change in f of g of x relative to a change in x is just, according to the chain rule, uh, the change in g of x relative to a change in x, in other words, the derivative of g, times the change in f of g of x relative to a change in g of x. That is, after all, kind of the meaning of f prime of g of x. It's how much f changes relative to a change in g. And, of course, the proof involves just treating these as if they're fractions. Do you guys see this? It just like cancels, right? Okay. So, um, so uh, yeah, uh, no. Isn't that not a loose proof at all? Because you can actually take the limits and then just multiply it. Yeah, so this is, this, is a, this is a loose proof in a certain sense, right? It's a loose proof because it... These are all infinitesimally small quantities, and I'm just supposing, I'm treating derivatives like as if they were fractions. Right? A derivative is not a fraction, um, but um, a derivative is a limit. But any one, even though the derivative is not a fraction, it's a limit, it is the limit of a fraction. So it oftentimes behaves like a fraction, and this is one of those times when it does. Okay? So this is one of those times in which you can just treat derivatives as if they're fractions, and it just works out. Okay, um, hopefully I've tried to motivate this to some degree. Um, let's now actually do the proof. The proof is not that hard. In fact, Noah thinks it's, uh, it's almost done, and it is, in a sense, almost done. So, um, so let's compute uh, the derivative of f of g of x. Well, 
the first step is um, the first step is easy. So someone give me the first step. Russell, give me the first step. What? No way. It's like we have to do this by by the definition. Okay, he's like zoning out. Um, he's yeah, Timothy. Really okay, Timothy. He said take the derivative of two Okay, wait, dude, hold on. We're doing the proof. Yeah, someone. Yeah, any one. Can you find the limit as h equal to zero? Yeah, that's all. Oh, uh, minus f of g of f of g of x over h. Okay, so that's just that's what I was looking for. Just the definition based on the definition of the derivative. So that's like step one. Uh, all right. Immediately, I have no idea what to do next. Basically, right at this point, uh, there's no obvious algebraic simplification or anything like that. So I have to start thinking already straight up, straight off from line one. Okay, what can we do? Uh, yeah, what can we do now to this thing? What can we do? There's a somewhat, I wouldn't say obvious, but there's a somewhat clear thing that we can do now using this loose proof as our guide. I don't want to separate them into different things. Of course I have a zero over zero situation, as I always do. I heard a couple people mumble it. Eli, what do we do? But taking a few examples. Okay, no, 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 no. we're doing the proof now. Um, Noah. Multiply it by g of x plus h minus g of x over that, like, yeah, so yeah. then it's if, that. If the chain rule basically says that we can treat derivatives like fractions in this instance, then let's just do that, right? What's missing from our, what's missing from our proof is that delta g of x on the top and the delta g of x on the bottom. So notice says, look, let's just do that. Inside the limit, where it's like legit, let's just multiply the top and bottom by g of x plus h minus g of x over g of x plus h minus g of x. Oh. Camille, now what? Now what? Why did he want to do that? What can we do? Uh, Guys are on video, so like act really smart, like sit up straight and... Oh, yes, well, Miss Rose, hmm, yeah, that's a very good idea. Well, I can do that. Should I take video of students pondering? Um, no. 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 Yes. Uh, what should we do? No. Wait, what? Uh, tell Nance, what do we do? Separated. Just separate it, and it just, it just is what you want it to be, right? So just split it up. She says, let's just split this up, and let's hope it works. So we get, um, we get f of g of x plus h minus f of g of x over uh, g of x plus h minus uh, g of x. So we get this limit times uh, the limit as h goes to zero of, uh, of g of x plus h minus g of x all over h. Um, Okay, this is brilliant. What is that thing on the right? That is, of course, just by definition, g prime. It helps that we already know what the theorem is, or what we think it is. Okay, now I have to do something kind of over here, uh, which is a little bit uh, tricky. Oh, um, so by the way, it turns out that uh, I'm discovering, as I'm doing the proof, that uh, g better be differentiable. That, that better be one of our, um, our, our conditions. Um, okay, so that, that g is differentiable. Um, uh, what else? Well, okay, now I'm going to introduce some kind of, I'm going to do sort of a variable limit switchy switchy here. Let's, um, let's let, uh, okay, so what happens, uh, oh, here, here we go. Let's let, how do I do this? Oh, yeah. Let's, um, let, let g of x be represented by a new number a. Uh, and let's call g of x plus h, let's call that t. Okay, what happens as h approaches zero, what can I say about g of x plus h? It goes to g of x, right? 
And in fact, what is this? Um, what does this actually say? This sentence right here, that as h goes to 0, g of x plus h goes to g, what property of g is that affirming? That is continuity, right? That is just the definition. This is just saying that g is continuous, uh, continuous at x. Um, and since I've already assumed that g is differentiable, then I do definitely know that it is continuous. So since as, since as h goes to 0, g of x plus h goes to g of x, I could rewrite this in terms of my new variables. I could say that as h goes to 0, uh, t goes to a. Um, all right, given that that is true, let's rewrite this limit in terms of a's and t's. So this becomes the limit, well, as t goes to a of f of t minus f of a all over t minus a. Do you recognize that? You should. That is, yeah, by the definition of the derivative, that is? A. This is f prime of a, right? This is f prime of a. And subbing it back in, if a is g of x, this in fact proves. You guys see this? That this is f prime of g of x times g prime of x. So that is how you take the derivative um, of a composite function. Pretty awesome. Okay. Um, so, um, so I think this is a really important rule. It comes up again and again and again and again. Um, and so you have to use the chain rule virtually all the time when you're differentiating functions. And we're going to use it over and over again the rest of the whole year. It's not that, it's not really that hard, but I've found in the past that certain students like just don't let it into their brain as quickly as they should. So what we're going to do now, I think we have like 20 minutes, right? We're going to do some practice. Uh, we've got like 15 minutes. Perfect. Uh, okay, so I have some examples somewhere. Here, thing. Um, so take out a piece of paper, and we're now going to basically just practice this bunch of examples. So here we go. Um, so I give you a bunch of problems uh, that require the chain rule, probably, and you take the derivative. You can kind of go at your own pace slash semi sort of work together, and we will go over this. Those of you at home should now, you know, like pause and try these. Maybe we'll do the first like one or two together.